Optimizing your immune system. The immune system, wow, what an incredible thing that is within us. It is so undefinable and it is working all the time and there is so much involved and if you have a good immune system, you have good energy, you have a clear brain, you have no brain fog, you are resilient. It helps you fight inflammation so it keeps your arteries clear and when your muscles are injured it fixes your muscles. We are going to talk more about the immune system as we regard preventing colds and flus and your more serious disorders. Um, uh, I think it's, it's, a, it's a very timely topic, uh, the immune system. There's some few real key basics. The, the, the topic is extremely complex. Um, we're going to try to break it down into easy steps on what to do uh, and what not to do. Uh, it's, um, folks, you don't need the flu shot. You don't need to get a cold or a flu. I've been fortunate and blessed with the fact that in my years of practice, which is going on almost 25 years now, I've not had a single cold ever. And that's not boasting or bragging, I'm truly thankful for that. But if you hit the right buttons, you don't have to get these things. And people think, oh no, I didn't get my flu shot. Oh, you know, you hear all this and, and, and the flu shot has so many detrimental effects to it that most of the world does not use it. We were at a very interesting conference on women's health this weekend and there was some very intense information and on it I was noting uh, a, a sliding scale on the health of nations where the World Health Organization uh, notes us. I, I, I noted that uh, my, my country of origin, the Netherlands, uh, was now ranked number one in the world and um, and they, they finally beat Switzerland. Um, and and uh, we are at number 50. And, and there's various marks on that, but that puts us far into the third world country territory. We're not even anywhere near where westernized medicine should be. And yet we are being touted as the best healthcare system in the world and on and on. But folks, come on, number 50? and we are expending per patient four to five times as much as they do in Europe, twice as much as they do in Canada. There's, there's something that's really fundamentally wrong with what we do. Because we have the technology available, we have the smarts, we can put people on the moon 40 years ago, right? So there's all these things that we can do, and yet there's something very wrong on many levels. Um, and it shows up as far as immune system function and let's call it dysfunction. So what we're going to get into is the basics in the immune system. I'm going to cover a favorite topic of mine, winter hibernation. I know that one's going to sound weird. Dr. Stacy's going to cover sleep and vitamin D. And Dr. Kate will get into some very cool new supplements. I will also wrap up with probiotic and give you an overall wrap up and overview of the immune system. So that's how we're going to pull things out. Before we dig deeper into the seminar, I want to give you a heads up. My blog is going to start covering a lot of week to week information as far as what's afflicting West Michigan, what are us doctors seeing. And so, for example, if a flu bug is going around that's really affecting the lungs or, say, the stomach, what are the symptoms? What are some preventative steps? What am I using for treatment? And so you'll have a weekly update as far as uh, what's what on the barometer of health in, in West Michigan. I think you'll like that. These blogs are also going to, uh, 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 right now we're covering um, uh, uh, all the biomarkers of health, uh, which, what, what are the most important things to measure in health. So I, I think you'd enjoy doing that and I'm actually uh, doing them weekly for once instead of every random here and there. Um, the resources has a tremendous amount of uh, things in it. Uh, uh, just explore it. It's, it's amazing. A lot of articles, a lot of things that we find interesting are just gathered there. And then our media, uh, uh, page, uh, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube. Uh, you can find all of our uh, things. Our Facebook now has over a thousand regular followers, about 1,100. Um, YouTube is being followed worldwide uh, and I'm extremely pleased uh, for it. Some of our uh, seminars uh, 
have had over 12,000 viewings uh, already uh, that people have downloaded it. So, so it's, um, it's, it's become a popular item, so feel free to just dig into that. So some basics on the immune system. It's all over the place. The blood is often treated as the hallowed, anointed oil of the immune system. It is not. It is a mere backup. And it's what we use for measuring everything, isn't it? Oh, let's get my blood work done. Oh, it might be a little bit off in white blood count. Maybe your neutrophils are up, your eosinophils are down, or your monocytes are up, right? Very valuable test. I don't want to, to diminish that because it does tell us something. But remember, this is kind of a reactive, last ditch effort to get rid of whatever is going on. Blood uh, uh, viruses uh, can be measured, uh, bacterial, all that. But again, it's last stage. We have so many more layers. One of our layers is the thymus gland. And the thymus is much ignored. It, it shrivels uh, up very quickly as we age. It is a uh, producer of T lymphocytes, which all, as far as we know, we have about 35 different subtypes. When I went to school, there was three of them and uh, that we knew about. And for example, we, now we know that if the thymus is in balance, that T1 cells to T2 cells might be off balance and that is the cause of allergies. And if you can get those back in balance again, allergies can actually go away. We see a lot of patients with very, uh, um, life-threatening allergies, uh, whether it be to peanuts or soy or eggs. And if we can get the thymus gland to start producing normal ratios of the, those T cells again, you can actually cure that patient. Um, uh, the things that a lot of allergists are now running towards is, is uh, given the actual food in very, very tiny microscopic quantities and touting that uh, new therapy. Folks, we've been doing that for almost 25 years already. It's, it's been done in Europe for a long time and you can, if you work on the immune system with the thymus gland and you work with um, uh, teaching the immune system to be normal, it's amazing how you can uh, effectively treat these patients. Our lymph nodes, they're easily palpable, mostly here, as well as in the groin here. We have them all over. They're, they're, they, along with the lymphatic uh, vessels, uh, really, they carry away debris from the fight against viruses and bacteria, and it's kind of a dumping ground for infectious materials. Appendix, we used to think uh, that this was just a vestigial uh, uh, little thing that had no function, ha ha. Um, it has major functions, and um, the longer I've been around, I've seen anything that we consider extra or, or uh, doesn't have a function. Um, yeah, we eventually find out something very specific about it. The appendix is a little reservoir for good bacteria. Uh, and uh, if something hits uh, like food poisoning or antibiotic or some medication that strips us of the good bacteria in the gut, we've got this little pouch that has lots of extra bacteria and can reseed our intestinal tract with that good immune boosting stuff. So this, this is really a, a cool thing to have, obviously. And it can also be a dumping ground for uh, waste that uh, need more time to digest or to deal with by the liver, and the body can store it there temporarily uh, to, uh, so the body get, it gives the body more time to deal with it. Your bone marrow, uh, it gives you all the precursors to your antibodies and the things that, that flow into the bloodstream as far as fighting your uh, uh, bugs that might be present. Um, and uh, uh, and on and on it goes, but the most important part of your immune system is really the gut. The immune system though, as, as you, can, you can see, is, is covered by a whole bunch of things. And what we've done to try to explain functional medicine is, is design this web to give you an idea how everything is interconnected. Um, and the immune system uh, is very much affected, for example, by liver function, detoxification, uh, as well as kidney function. Uh, if there's a lot of toxicity flowing around, uh, you are going to alter uh, the immune response because it says, hey, something toxic is here, I'm going to be activated, and it's going to be busy doing uh, that instead of fighting viruses. So we try to keep our patients detoxified, clean, so that the liver can do what it's supposed to do, the liver affects the gut, so the gastrointestinal tract is probably about 70% of the immune system. It's pretty important as far as immunity. So. Um, it's not just the bacteria that live there, but also the gut-associated lymphoid tissue, which is all the lymph nodes all around the gut, um, that is our main first responders to almost all viruses and bacteria. Um, 
the gut is, uh, has so many bugs living in it that it, they outnumber us about 10 to 1 cells to bacteria. So, so it's unbelievable how many bacteria we have. And if I were to vaporize every single cell in your body and just look, you could actually see your entire outline, especially in the gut of just bacteria before that pff, they would go away. That's how many bacteria we have. Uh, we are nothing but carriers of bacteria. So we are barely human. <laughs> and so, so the gut is very important and we're just starting to see the, the evidence coming out in, in the North American uh, medical journals on the importance of the microbiome, it's called. And, um, and we're going to spend a little bit more time on that later. Um, and uh, urinary tract uh, obviously is, is uh, waste, uh, getting rid of waste. Uh, I can go on and on, the cardiovascular and respiratory system. Uh, th there's another first line of defense in your lungs and sinuses because it's constantly exposed to everything. So there's an incredible amount of white blood cells living close to that area. And when something needs an immediate reaction, it doesn't have to go from the blood to the lungs. No, boom, it's right there. So it's, it's an incredible, powerful immune um, uh, uh, boosting uh, organ. Your hormones affect the immune system tremendously. Um, if you are low in say the thyroid uh, uh, gland, um, you're going to be so much more prone to colds and flus. Um, if you're estrogen dominant, uh, you are inflamed and that inflammation will affect your gut and the gut affects the immune system. See how that's all interconnected. Um, and uh, if you're uh, depressed, that has an incredible, incredible effect on the immune system, especially uh, with stress. Stress is so toxic to the immune system. And it's a well-known fact that if you go through some sort of shocking event, like say a car wreck or death of a loved one or so through a divorce, most people know that you are so much more prone to colds and flus during that time. It's, it's a well-known fact and very often when we come to a new patient, uh, when, when, when the doctors do a, a history and say, well, how did this autoimmune disease start, whether it's rheumatoid arthritis or, or whatever we're dealing with, very often, I would say 90% of the time, it was during a period of stress uh, that say, okay, this was the trigger and from there on out, that, that's when I had this, going through a divorce, something like that. So, so moods are uh, incredible drivers for the immune system too. And as you can tell, I can go on and on and spend a whole bunch of hours on this. So let's move on before you fall asleep. So I, I, I'm always in a unique position coming from Europe and then living over here and traveling back to Europe a lot, attending classes in both continents. Uh, on, on, on figuring out, okay, what are they doing right and wrong, and what are we doing right and wrong? And um, I was actually talking to my 84-year-old mom about this today. Uh, I gave her a quick phone call and said, what are you talking about? This is what I'm talking about. And so what are you going to be talking about? I says, well, I told her in, in Dutch, uh, which to this day is my best social language, I, I said, um, I, I'm going to be talking about how we have to spend more time outdoors. She goes, oh, well, yeah, that makes sense. And, and uh, it, it, it's funny how so many things are so, such common sense. And why does that make sense? It's because the, the one thing that I notice living over here is, is a few things. One, even in the summer, if you have this beautiful restaurant with a nice veranda outside, they have a hard time filling that outside space. The, ins the people are inside more than they are outside. In the Netherlands, even in the rain, they're sitting outside eating. And not just in the Netherlands, but everywhere. If you go and look around neighborhoods, say at supper time, you'll see entire families walking after supper. It's a cultural thing. It's something you do. It's 15, to, to 15 minutes to half an hour. You talk to anybody, say, why are you doing this? Well, it's good for our digestion. That's what my mom told me, and that's what her grandma told me, and it goes on and on. You know, it's just part of culture. It's, it's what you do. And then you meet your neighbors, you know, it's a sense of community, and you talk. And, and I, I remember doing this, and I consider that totally normal. I think to most of us Americans, this is gonna say, that's kind of weird to do that. You see all these people crowding the streets and walking after supper, and after lunch, uh, pe people actually go home for lunch, and then on their bicycles are walking, and then they bike back. Even us students, I, I remember in grade school, even I was expected to bike home for lunch and bike back. Um, 
And uh, now out comes this evidence that uh, we were exposed to uh, this weekend that shows that just 15 minutes of walking after a meal decreases the glucose spike and thus the hypoglycemia by almost 50%. 50%. It was, it was, it's it's mind-boggling to see the normal versus just a little bit of movement. We're not talking running or weightlifting or doing anything that even gets you out of breath. We're talking movement outside. It just does an incredible effect on sugar levels. So why not do that? It's hard for me to, to beat that. And movement is absolutely critical. It seems like movement outside is even better. And this is especially true as the weather is changing because new science has shown that exposure to cold boosts the immune system a lot. And this is something that a lot of us are not getting. We hybridate. Oh, I hate winter and I'm not going to do that. <laughs> Yeah, and then you, you watch, it's funny, you watch, watch them walk outside, you know, it's raining a little bit or sleeting and they're like, <laughs> right, you, you, you know, it's like, it's like I'm making myself invisible, no, you might also just embrace it, I mean, it's, it's just embrace it, it was raining this weekend, I went for a run, I loved it, I absolutely loved it, it's just reinvigorating all those positive ions in the air, yeah, I my mean, feet got wet, whatever, it, it doesn't matter. That's, it's, if you don't adapt to the changing conditions, and let's say you've hibernated and you go outside, you get blasted by that cold, now it's a stress on the body. And what happens when you're under stress? A decline in the immune system, and bing, yes, you did catch that cold. But it's a proven fact, and they, this research was stu st started actually in Germany, that if you take a, a shower and you end it with cold for a minute, just a minute, you boost your immune system by about 27% on average. So they've taken that research, that's where it started, that was back in the 60s that they proved that. And then, so they took that and they studied that those that do not get sick, on average, spend two hours outside per day, whether it's in the summer or in the winter. And that's about how much it takes to adapt to the climate change. So in order to start embracing the weather out there and just accepting what's there instead of fighting it, you just have to be out there. And something scary might happen. We might start actually liking winter. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this, so this is a pretty important factoid. And you know what? I don't think you have to spend two hours. I bet you a half an hour would be beneficial or an hour. It's just the, the, the research, the sweet spot showed it to be two hours. That's what it takes to adapt to the cold and to, to not to be impervious to those changes and actually have it be an immune system booster instead of a stressor. So get out of the hibernation mode. Make it a point to adapt to the changes and just be outside all the time. It's actually pretty huge advice I'm giving here and it's so basic and so simple, but we now actually have science to prove it. Something that we've actually Dr. Denmark, known, yeah. Can you touch a little bit on the thyroid as well because it helps people with thyroid issues? Yeah, for sure. So the thyroid, thyroid issues is huge. Uh, over 50% of women at age 50 and above have thyroid issues that's not diagnosed. Uh, and thyroid is a main problem because it's one of our main drivers of the, of the hormones. Look at it as a choir director. Uh, and the, the, the choir is the hormones and the director is, is, is the thyroid. So it's, it's pretty huge in, in the whole hormonal symphony in males and females. And uh, one of your signs and symptoms of thyroid deficiencies, there's many, but actually cold hands and feet. So if you're feeling cold to the core, that is one of, uh, one of its signs and symptoms. And so temperature regulation is, is, is pretty important. And for those of us that can never ever get warm anywhere, they're always the coldest one in the room, make sure you talk to us about it. Thyroid is often checked by TSH and TSH alone misses, I would say about 80 to 90% of thyroid problems. It's not good enough. It just checks what the brain is telling the thyroid. It checks nothing else and that's like, your heater not working and all the, the, the furnace uh, uh, man or woman comes into the house and checks the thermostat only says, no, your thermostat's fine, bye. That's really what you're doing with TSH. It's not, you gotta check the furnace itself too. So we go to much more sophisticated testing when we go after the thyroid. But 
when the thyroid is never stimulated, because the thyroid is a little bit like a muscle. It needs nutrients, it needs oxygen, it needs the proper nerve input, but it also needs to be stressed once in a while, just like a muscle. So it needs to actually have to work like a temperature change to keep it fit. And we've babied our thyroids too much, which is part of the reason that we're seeing just a plethora of thyroid conditions out there. Does that cover what you wanted me to cover? Yeah, yeah. They just, I just saw a really interesting research article that said the more that we spend going from outside and, and changing our temperature and not always yep. sitting in a controlled environment will prevent thyroid issues down the line or Absolutely. help the ones yep. that are already there. Yep. Again, it's, it's stressing it just in the right way instead of overstressing it. Now, of course, we overstress it with sleep deprivation, vitamin D deficiency, and all kinds of things that the doctors here are going to cover. So there's more to it than that, but, but uh, we, uh, we do have to cover this stuff. So, so this, this hibernation, I, I know it, it sounds weird, but it's amazing how that can help prevent colds and flus. You have to adapt to the environment. Sleep is another one, and Dr. Stacy is going to cover that favorite topic. Absolutely critical. Listen closely to this one. Hello. So tonight I chose a fun, difficult topic because nobody likes to do this. <laughs> or if they like to do this, they're not getting enough of it. Um, Basically, I picked a couple different research articles that I thought were very interesting on why sleep is so important because we all are kind of going into the, I get about five to six hours. I feel pretty good. Well, research states that if you are getting less than seven to eight as an adult, you are increasing your risk for cardiovascular disease, diabetes, autoimmune disease, and chronic diseases throughout the rest of your life. The more that you lose sleep, also the more your immune system goes down. They believe that whenever you lose an hour of sleep, it's up to 30% taxing on your immune system the next day. They've done studies on patients that they've given vaccines to, and they've had less sleep than what they normally would, and the vaccine can actually make them sick because their immune system didn't build the immunity that it was supposed to do with that vaccine because they didn't get enough sleep that night to build up the immune system and really what that vaccine was supposed to do for it. So what this graph is basically saying is that um, from 18 to 75 plus, how many people are actually reporting that they're sleeping less than six hours a night? The red on the far left here, or my, your far left, my right. Um, the red is actually men in 1985. The next darker red, the more crimson, is men in 2004. The first blue, the light blue, is women in 1985, and then the darker blue is women in 2004. So that's a pretty big shift. If you look all the way across in the age groups, basically everybody's sleeping less. This really develops a problem. Now, they also only did 18 to 75. So the problem is here is that we're also not talking about children. Children from zero to preteens need at least 10 hours of sleep. Do you know how many times that I've been shopping at Meijer at 9.30 at night for that last known thing that you absolutely have to have? And you see a mom with all of her kids walking right on through going, and I'm thinking to myself, why are they in bed? I'd be in bed right now. But they're not. And that's, that's one of the issues that we're seeing with a lot of our children is number one, they're not getting enough sleep. How can you focus in school? How can you learn anything if your brain is not developing in those sleep hours? They develop, your immune system builds, your body heals in those sleeping hours. They talk about different shortwave sleeps, the deep sleeps, the REM sleeps. All of those need to you have alternate four to six times a night between deep sleep and REM. That's very, very important. Now, people that tend to struggle with sleep of course, there's some deeper issues going on. We could have adrenal dysfunction, we could have thyroid dysfunction, we could have an autoimmune disease going on, we could have a, just an intestinal tract imbalance. Serotonin is produced in the gut, 95% of it is produced in the digestive tract. Serotonin creates a calm. That's the antidepressive hormone, right? If your gut's unhappy, what's gonna happen to the rest of your body? very unhappy. So that's why we always talk a lot about digestive health in this office. Sleep deficiency for me is, 
is very important because there were a couple different things on um, one of the lovely articles that I found off PubMed. And what I loved about this one is it talked about the increase in fat consumption. Now how many people also don't have enough fat in their diet? The problem is, is either too much fat or too little fat can lead to sleep deficiency. So it's right in the center that we've got to try to keep everything. Anytime you have any disruption in your metabolic, this is where the blood sugar regulation comes in. Your diabetics, your pre-diabetics, anybody that struggles with hypoglycemia, say 3, 4 o'clock in the afternoon, you start to get really sleepy, you probably have some blood sugar imbalance. That's over time going to tax you and create sleep imbalances for you. Increased grenulin. I like grenulin and leptin because these two are really important, important things in your body. Um, grenulin is an amino acid peptide. This creates hunger. Okay? When we're hungry, we have grenulin going. The problem is, is if we get too little of sleep, sometimes it increases our hunger for some people all day long, so they're eating, 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 and some people just don't eat at all. I have a lot of patients that walk in and I ask them, how many times a day do you eat? And they sit there and they think, I had a meal yesterday, just one. Pretty typical too. Wow, calorie deprivation is not the way to go. They do talk about cutting back on calories can increase lifespan, but that's not really what they're talking about, is going down to one to two meals a day. They're talking about keeping them all in balance um, and cutting down on the sugars and the saturated fats. Leptin is also your satiety hormone. We also build this. Your, your leptin should go high while you're sleeping. So leptin should stay high while we're sleeping. When we wake up within an hour, the grenulin should take over. When we have an imbalance of these two, then we start to struggle all the way throughout the day with your adrenal function will be off, your cortisol will raise at the wrong times. We tend to get up at 3, 4 o'clock in the morning. We'll tend to have an immune system imbalance the next day as well. We're more susceptible to anybody that has the stuffy colds running around. Any increase in body BMI, sorry, body mass index, that is, for us, we're not a fan of this marker, but this is, this is one that has a lot of studies behind it. So they're saying for every point increase on BMI, it will increase your sleep deficiency or sleep problems by anywhere up to 10% per one, one point increase. That could be problematic for a lot of people. The other thing is increased, increased insulin resistance. Now a lot of people don't realize they have insulin resistance. A lot of people have it but don't know and wait and it, it shows up more in the 50s, 60s, some people as early as 40s. But that's where those typical signs and symptoms of you start to get sleepy after lunch or around 3, 4 o'clock. If you wake up, you skip breakfast, you're creating insulin resistance down the way. Breakfast is the most important meal of the day. A balanced breakfast is the most important meal of the day. Our health coaches will tell you that all the way through. My other big thing with the immune system that I know we weren't really going to touch much on, but they truly believe that the immune system, we play it too clean nowadays. We're all so worried, we're running around with antibacterial wipes. Oh, hold on, hold on, oh gosh, you got bacteria on you, let's get you cleaned up. Can't have you touch anything, you can't, can't do anything until you get your face washed off. I ate dirt when I was little, all the time, mud pies. <laughs> My mom could not keep me clean. And I'm sure to this day that that's part of what has built my immune system. They feel that the more and more we've become attached to the antibacterial, the antimicrobials, the worse our immune system has gotten. We have more sicknesses now than we ever have. And it's because we always have these cleanly practices. They've even done research studies in hospitals that don't use bleach and they have dust on top of things. And they don't struggle with the MRSA infections like we do. They don't struggle with the chronic bacterial overload. So there's something to be said about having a little bit of dirt in somebody's system. It doesn't always hurt you. But it's good to let your kids get a little dirty. It's okay. It's not going to harm them. Vitamin D is one of the most important nutrients that you could use in your body. When you look on um, any of the research sources, there's over 26,000 research articles on vitamin D. Now when you break it down and you do sleep in vitamin D, it comes up to about 1,200. The immune system in vitamin D is 2,600 research articles. So vitamin D has so much. It really came into light in about 2008 when Dr. Michael Hollick 
did a lot of research and came out with the fact that four to 800 IUs of vitamin D is definitely not enough. Okay, it may be preventing rickets, and that's all, but it's not preventing all the other chronic diseases. There is a vitamin D receptor on basically every cell in your body. Your immune system that we build from, when, from the time that we're in mom's womb starts with mom needing to have enough vitamin D. If mom doesn't have enough vitamin D within her body, she can create her kids to be more likely to be sick because it's harder to build up those vitamin D stores and get your body to continue to support your immune system, your adaptive and your innate. Your innate immune system is the one that you're born with. The adaptive one is one that com you come in contact with and your body adapts over time. They did studies on mice and what they did is they found the mice that didn't have, that were no vitamin D or very low vitamin D levels when they were pregnant and they had little pups. From, from three to eight weeks, they found that the vitamin Ds were still really low in the pups. So they started to supplement. And they supplemented about 2,000 IUs from three to eight weeks, and they found no change in the vitamin D. They had a hard time building that vitamin D up because mom was deficient to start out with. Vitamin D can also lead to autoimmune disorders. It can lead to hormonal imbalances, cognitive dysfunctions, anxiety, depression. All of those things can be tied in. But tonight we're gonna to talk mostly about why it's important in the immune system. If you have a deficiency, this article that I picked up said it affects 30 to 50 percent of the general population. This weekend when we were at the seminar, they said anywhere between 50 and 60 percent of the population is pretty common to have a vitamin D deficiency, especially if you live north of the equator. That would be us. Just in case you guys didn't know where we're at, I usually don't, so I'm like, north of the equator, where's that at? <laughs> so, yes, that is us. And they say, even if, you're, if you work inside, you're vitamin D deficient, even through the summer, because you are not outside at high noon. Usually anywhere between, they say, 10 and 2 are the times that you want to be outside for up to 30 minutes in a bathing suit. I don't know how many of you guys bring a bathing suit to work. I do not. So, um, you're probably not getting that five days a week. The nice thing about vitamin, Z, vitamin D when it comes to the sun, you can never get too much. Now, can you harm your skin? Of course you can. That's where common sense comes in. But with the vitamin D from sun, we cannot get too much. You can get too much from supplements. But they say on average, anywhere between one to 5,000 IUs is what they expect to, once you're up at your store levels. When you, when you take a 25, OHD level, that's the one that they're testing. They want it to be between 60 and 80. Once you get to that point, they believe that you can hold it anywhere between 1 to 1,000 and 2,000 IUs supplemented. But we haven't always seen that. So sometimes research is not what you see clinically. Now, deficiency in vitamin D also creates sleepiness throughout the day. Why do you think that is? It affects every part of the body. So it's not only in the immune system, but it's gonna create the fact that the hunger regulation is off, it's gonna create the hormonal imbalance. The thyroid definitely needs vitamin D for metabolism and cold, heat cold. Immune suppression is very, very common with a lack of vitamin D. They've even shown, th shown articles that, that say that if you supplement somebody with five to 10,000 IUs when they get sick, you can get their immune system kicked up within two to three days. So you can shorten your sickness time. So that's a lot of times you'll hear us say, are you taking your vitamin D? What levels are you at? We need to double that for three days, okay? Diabetes is one of the other most common things with vitamin D. If we have a diabetic patient, it's always a guarantee we have some vitamin D deficiency. The other thing is, is multiple, multiple diseases, which we talked about, all the autoimmune diseases, Basically everything that they have listed as a disease right now, they're finding that vitamin D could be a causative factor or adding to the problem. Everything's not just a one size fits all. Vitamin D is part of the overall picture. Just like everything we talk about tonight is part of the overall picture for the immune system. And I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Kate as we move into some more immune boosters for you. Perfect. All right, so I get to talk a little bit more about some specifics of what we can do um, for our immune system. We've talked about uh, how the web 
functions when it comes to immunity. We've talked about hibernation. We've talked about uh, sleep, vitamin D. And say you're doing all of that, right? Say you're doing great on all of that, 100%. I'm right on cue. I'm not hibernating. I'm getting enough sleep. And you start to feel that cold coming on. You, so, you start to feel, so you start to feel a cold coming on. That happens, right? We all, we all kind of know that feeling. We're good. All right, so uh, what are some things you can do? Well, first of all, I'd like to talk about a product that we have here called Essential Defense. So when you think about Essential Defense, I want you to think the first 24 hours of feeling sick. So when you get that, you wake up in the morning, you're like, mm, feeling kind of cruddy. But I don't have really a runny nose or a sore throat, maybe a little fatigue. Uh, it's just that initial feeling of, I'm coming down with something. That's when you need to use essential defense. Essential defense uh, also works great following a sudden temperature change. So we've been kind of going back and forth a little bit here in Michigan lately with temperature changes. So this is your guy um, for when you start to feel that coming on, especially in cold, wet weather. Uh, I mentioned that it's the first 24 hours, that initial immune defense. So the first signs of cold and flu is when you want to use your essential defense. And how we like to use it is, what we'll do is we'll have you take two, one or two tablets every hour or half an hour for the first 24 hours following that. So you're basically running through almost a whole bottle of this stuff right away. And it, prevent, it really knocks out any sort of cold and flu that you could have come up. How does it work? Well, Essential Defense is one of our awesome Chinese herbal formulas, near and dear to my heart for a couple different reasons. Um, but the idea of Chinese medicine, for those of you who don't have any exposure to that, is balance. So in TCM or traditional Chinese medicine, we're always talking about not too hot, not too cold, not too windy, not too calm. Okay, not too light, not too dark, that kind of balance. In, in modern medicine, we call that homeostasis or steady state. That's what our body is constantly striving for. And as, our, as things hit us and we fluctuate from steady state, if our bodies are healthy, they can bring it back to that homeostasis. In Chinese medicine, we refer to it as yin and yang. It's the light and dark. If you've ever seen that yin yang, it's a light and dark with two dots in it. Anybody nod your heads if you've seen it? Great. So that's what I'm talking about here with Chinese medicine. So in, in TCM, when we look at the herbs for essential defense, we're looking at soothing and warming because of that temperature change, okay, when it gets too cold or too windy, we're looking to soothe and warm. So we use a couple different things, for Scythia, Japanese honeysuckle. These, these formulas have been around a really, really long time, 12,000 AD, if you look at that. That's a extremely, well, I can't even fathom how long ago that was. And they're still used today. Now, they do have a lot more research backing them up than they used to. Um, we don't always know exact mechanisms for that. So when we talk about Chinese herbs, we worry more about where are they sourced from? Making sure that they're pure, that they're actually what they say they are in the bottle. And that's why we use Essential Defense because we have that backing from the company that we use for that. Um, in 25 cases of URI, that's upper respiratory infection. Okay, your kind of classic cold and flu, bronchitis, sinusitis, runny nose, sore throat. A total effective rate was 90. 0.2%. And that's at preventing it from going any further. So that's not just cutting back the time of your flu or cold, like some of the over-the-counter medications do, maybe by one day if they're lucky. This is actually preventing it from progressing to a full cold and flu experience. So that's our essential defense. Think initial 24 hours when you're looking at that one. Next we're going to talk about a newer product called Immucor. Um, those of you who've been around the practice for a while, you may not have heard of this one, so I'm going to cover it briefly. What, what Immucor uses is a three-pronged approach. So we've got a couple different ingredients in it, and I'm going to go through them separately and what, what they all do. So ultrapotency is the first one. Some of you are familiar with that. It's a vitamin C formula. We're going to talk about that. Zinc. We'll talk about the benefits of zinc for your immune system and mushroom extracts, okay? They're not just the mushrooms you get at the grocery store. They're specific types of formulated mushrooms, again, that have been studied for a very long time. Um, so what do we see with Immucor? Well, overall enhancement of the immune system. And we talk about a couple of these immune cells. We've got 
they're called macrophages, NK or natural killer cells, and T cells or T lymphocytes. So our macrophages, those are our Pac-Mans, okay? They go around and they glom on to any sort of uh, bacteria or virus or even a toxin that might be produced by a bacteria or a virus. And they glom on, they eat it up, they engulf it, and then they break it down inside. So I like to think of them as little Pac-Mans that are chasing the little ghosts through. I, I'm aging myself. Um, <laughs> Natural killer cells are what they sound like. They're part of your natural immunity. Some of our immunity is learned immunity, so that's the kind of immunity where uh, you get exposed to a cold and then your immune system learns, okay, this is what that cold looks like. Next time, I'm gonna have a, a cell, a T cell usually, that can immediately attack that because I've seen it before. Your natural killer cells aren't like that. Natural killer cells are part of our innate immunity. They're in us from the very beginning. And they're a little bit less specific, but equally important, maybe even more important than the T cells. And so the T cells, like I just explained, that's the kind that learns, okay? That's the part of your immunity that can tell, okay, I've seen this virus before, I've seen this bacteria before, and I can mount a better defense against it. So unlike essential defense, we wanna use Immucor once you're already sick, um, and for maintenance, it can also be used that way. So the difference really is in dosage. For maintenance, you're mainly going to take two a day throughout the cold season, cold and flu season. Um, once you're already six, you're going to bump that up to maybe two or three tabs, two or three times a day. And we can give you more specifics on that. So what's in there? We talked already, about, we listed them, so let's go through ultrapotent C. So this is a, a vitamin C. You've all heard about vitamin C, how it's so good for you, for your immune system. The nice thing about this vitamin C is it's not just ascorbic acid. So ascorbic acid is your run-of-the-mill grocery store brand vitamin C, okay? That is not what is in here. Ultrapotent C actually has a patented augmented vitamin C or PAVC. That means it's buffered, okay? It's attached to other minerals bound to it biologically. And what that does is it makes it easier to absorb into your cells. So you've probably heard uh, the adage that you can buy your vitamins and then flush them down the toilet, right? You don't actually absorb a lot of your vitamins. This is what's combating your absorption of vitamin C. If it's buffered or if it's augmented, it's easier for you to absorb and it works better. So not only is it easier to absorb, uh, but it also increases your natural killer activities even more than regular ascorbic acid. So I'm going to show you a couple charts here, quick a second. Don't freak out. It's okay. I'll explain them. <laughs> okay, so we got some lines here, some X and Y axes. So what we're looking at in the first one is ultrapotent C is shown to have 18% to 25% higher uptake in white blood cells than plain ascorbic acid. That's what I was mentioning before. So it's bound to magnesium, calcium, other kinds of molecules that allow it to be uptaken faster and better. So that's the dark orange line. See how it goes up really quickly and stays in the white blood cells? Much better than the ascorbic acid alone. The next slide you can see is that it's much more effective than plain vitamin C on actual natural killer cell activity. If you look at the dotted line, that's your plain ascorbic acid. Notice, so time after treatment, so you take the, your vitamin C pill at zero, right? Your natural killer activity is on this other axis here. See how it actually decreases after you take ascorbic acid? What does that mean? for us symptom-wise. Symptom it means we're gonna get sicker before we get better, right? Who wants that? Not me. If I'm gonna take something to get better, I want it to start now. I don't want there to be this dip in natural killer cell activity. I want them to start working better right away. And that's what you see with ultrapotency. See the difference there? How the blue line just goes, it doesn't have that initial dip. So again, that's part of the reason why we use that. So two big reasons why we like ultrapotency better, better absorbed, and you don't have that dip in your immunity right away. So that's why it's better than your grocery store brand. 
So we covered vitamin C, that's one of the things in there. Then we're going to talk about zinc. And when you talk about zinc, we usually talk about selenium with it because it's very similar, has a lot of the similar enzymatic activity, has, it catalyzes a lot of the same reactions. Um, zinc, you may have heard of zinc lozenges, right? Anybody heard of those? So that, yeah, so that's one way that we would try to get zinc in for part of our immunity. So it's kind of a, a more of an understood one similar to vitamin C that zinc does help with your immune function. So if you notice some of these slides here, it says physiological supplementation of zinc for one to two months restores immune responses and prolongs survival of the cell. Even a marginal zinc deprivation can affect immune function. And we test for zinc here at our office. Um, we'll have you swish a little bit in your mouth and see do you taste it, right? Has anybody here done that? The zinc test, remember that one? So a lot of our patients don't taste anything. That's way beyond marginal zinc deprivation. Okay? You should taste at least something or a little bit within a few seconds. So very, very easy to test for, for this zinc deficiency. And a lot of us, you'll find that we have that. Um, here we see our macrophages again in the next one. Phagocytosis, that's that activity of engulfing the bacteria okay, and breaking it down. So zinc deficiency impairs that in macrophages. Our natural killer cells are impaired as well. Um, and even a low dose supplementation of zinc and selenium does provide significant improvements. Okay, And there they're talking about vaccinations. But overall, we see a lot of benefit immunologically from adding zinc. Next we're going to talk about our high molecular weight polysaccharides or mushrooms. Okay. So select fungi, not your garden variety, unfortunately. These are very select for their medicinal properties. Again, usually studied over centuries in countries like Asia that we've come up with these. Um, there's a whole bunch of names there. Uh, mechanistically is what I'm more excited about, how they work. So first of all, they discourage adhesion. So bacteria and viruses have sticky parts on the outside of their cells so that they can get into your cells. Okay, they, they stick on and then they, they enter into the body or enter into the cells. This, these types of fungi are shown to discourage that. They also inhibit viral replication. Mini, mini lesson on how viruses work. Viruses need host cells in order to replicate. So when they infect your body, they're actually taking over your cells, using them to make their own DNA, which is mean and nasty for a lot of reasons. But this type of mushroom can inhibit that replication. So the viruses stop taking over your cells and you get your body back and, and the virus cannot spread that way. It also in general stimulates the immune system through a lot of the natural killer cells, macrophages, that kind of thing that we mentioned before. So why do we like mushrooms especially? Well, they're food classified. So, you know, there, there aren't going to be the interactions that you may have with vitamins or minerals, that kind of thing, because it's a food. You really, can't, you really can't do too much of it. That's one of the things. It's very safe because of that reason. Also, fungi are more closely related to animals than plants. We're animals, just in case you didn't realize. And we use a lot of plant-based medicines. However, Genetically, we, maybe we should look more towards fungi because they're more similar to us, right? If fungi have more similar gen genes than us, they're going to be more likely to help us. Also, they have the shared defense mechanisms. So the reason we use a blend of mushrooms is because these mushrooms work together in colonies to share immunity as a group. So if I were to just take, say, shiitake mushrooms, they would only have a fragment of the total potential immunology that these whole, the whole group of mushrooms has together. So it's like a 1 plus 1 equals 20 sort of situation where it's not just pick and choose. They choose this blend because they do share that immunologic function. They crosstalk okay, through different very, very sophisticated uh, signaling between each other. So different fungi coexist. They compete with different sets of microbes. Okay, so they're the ones that are coexisting, competing. And their defense mechanisms vary also between each other. So that's why we use that variety of mushrooms. Cool? 
That's what I thought too. Doc, would you like to talk about probiotics? Sure, why not? Thanks. Yeah. Fun stuff, right? Yeah. Essential defense uh, is, is really a good thing to keep on hand. Um, because you want to hit it now when symptoms erupt and if you wait six or eight hours before getting to the office to get it the, the whatever you're fighting has already progressed and you want to really try to hit it as fast as, as you can so nice to have on hand um, and um, uh, there's one other thing you wanted me to suggest fungus. oh yes these the, there's the, on the fungus there's uh, this misconception that if you have a yeast overgrowth you cannot use fungus uh, this is a totally different classification this is not candida uh, and it's perfectly safe to use if you have any kind of fungal overgrowth yourself in fact I'll dare say it helps fight that uh, because of that uh, uh, in that immunity that Dr. Kate so eloquently described uh, how one plus one plus one plus one equals multiples uh, it's, it's you're, you're getting an incredible uh, uh, fight against invaders including the uh, yeast overgrowth um, probiotics is an absolutely huge topic and uh, we uh, have evidence going back to the 18th century on its benefits we have writings going back in 1908 um, uh, the first real, uh, real official uh, medical paper was published on it, and uh, they're treating it like something new. Uh, folks, it's not. We've, we've known about the benefits of probiotics, and it seems like every generation we have to reinvent it and rediscover it, and it's, it's frankly a little bit tiring because we know of the great importance of the good bacteria living in our gut. They break down excess hormones. In fact, 50% of your estrogen metabolism is just the bugs alone. Uh, they break down our foods, they extract the vitamins, they make vitamins, and they are our good soldiers. So they, it's like they almost line up against the intestinal wall side by side by side so that these bad bugs that invade us continuously don't have room to, to attach to the intestinal wall and then find penetrance and go into the bloodstream and affect us in one way or another. So, so the good bacteria is under unprecedented attack in today's uh, uh, day and age due to the um, uh, incredible change in food that we've done in the last 50 years. The uh, processed carbohydrates, processed foods, the uh, new to man chemicals, which numbers in the tens of thousands now, have just given us an unprecedented attack uh, on, on these, these poor little bugs. Uh, the use of antibiotics and pharmaceuticals have reduced our bug populations from thousands to what we think now are just hundreds uh, of different kinds of species in, in the uh, gut and so we're afraid that we're studying a diminishing population and a lot of these things are going extinct before we even know anything about it. So that is why we're morphing into a sickly patient population that we are and I'm afraid that um, if I can point one, uh, one finger at our de decline of our economy, it's probably the decline of the microbiome. Uh, because it's going to cost us uh, great money financially and you can see that our government just struggling with with this 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 looming crisis uh, and all this this talk going back and forth and government shut down and this this health care bill and blah 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 all the stuff that you're seeing really is a result of a population that is becoming more and more sick isn't it and how do we truly take care of them and what do we do? That's, that's the, really the debate that's going on out there. So the microbiome, you can almost look at it as a center of, of a lot of that. And, um, and, and now we have evidence uh, in very recent studies that shows that with kids, if you supplement them uh, in uh, the first uh, year, uh, uh, you're, you're significantly uh, decreasing the amount of colds and flus. Just a bit of a probiotic once a day in children decreases colds and flu incidence by 55 percent on average if that's all you do we're not even talking about vitamin d or immucor or these these, these fungi we're, we're, we're talking just the probiotics so this is absolutely critical this is uh, uh, a very important component and uh, you can have so much fun treating patients health just by probiotics now probiotics is a very difficult science it's hard to get it right it's hard to get it in the bottle into the gut into the intestine and have it stay there it is a very imprecise science that we're still learning a lot about and I remember when I first checked uh, on the valid validity of various companies claims and how well it worked out of the 13 samples of different companies that I tested only two had live activity this is a few years ago 
And of those two, one had experienced genetic drift, which means it had morphed into another bug. One out of 13. Isn't that pathetic? This weekend I found out the very latest vitamin D study that showed that 30% of what's out there has none in it. Zero. Zip. Inside the bottle. 70% do not meet label claims. So that's 70% of the remaining. So there's, there's a lot of variability out there, which is why we see so many controversial studies because they're not always using the right product when they're using a study or they're using the wrong dose. But one thing is a slam dunk now. We know that the gut flora is absolutely critical and it can affect your immune system to such a great degree that I have um, uh, been recommending something kind of ucky to my um, autoimmune disease patients that do not respond to the traditional ways of treating them like ulcerative colitis, Crohn's, these are immune system diseases too. I know we're talking more colds and viruses, but remember these are immune system problems too. But since I've been in practice, I've been actually recommending fecal transplants uh, where, where, where the bacteria from one of your loved ones gets, gets, gets transplanted into the gut of, of, the, of, 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 of the afflicted one. And I can tell you with about 95% certainty that all symptoms clear out within two weeks of something that patients have been suffering from from decades. Just recently we had a, an eight-year-old who was immunocompromised and had an, an, an incredible uh, uh, yeast overgrowth, H. pylori, and was in and out of the hospitals at least once every two to three weeks. And we could not keep her well. And there's, there's some, a lot of other issues that went with it. I recommended this transplant and the first time in the eight years of her life, she was completely well in just one week. That is the power of our bacteria. It is phenomenal, we have to take care of it, so we have to be careful when to use antibiotics. In my home country, we cannot use antibiotics for ear infections anymore because most of those ear infections are, one, viral, and number two, they really don't respond to, back to the antibiotics for the most part anyway because it's hard for it to get to the ear infection. And number three, it affects the microbiome, your gut bacteria, for life. And we are developing our bacteria the first year of life. You are born with a sterile gut. It gets inoculated by mom at birth, which is why C-section is so shaky. If we need to do it, we need to do it. I, I get that. But if, why, do, why have 40% of our births now be C-sections? It is affecting that population tremendously. That person, that, that, little, that little baby who had a C-section is so much more prone to hormonal problems, immune system problems, autoimmune disease, their entire lives. So we try very hard the first year of life to give a probiotic to the baby because I know the doctors know that we are then affecting that baby for its entire life. In fact, a Finnish study was just completed that showed at age 40, if all you did was give a probiotic the first year of life, and some vitamin D the first year of life, and then didn't do that after that, by age 40, the incidence of autoimmune disease was down by more than 50% compared to the general population. So that's how much of an impact we can have just with gut bacteria. So I feel very passionate about this because I feel this is one of the main problems out in our society is that we have affected our gut bacteria tremendously. It is our first line of defense, and taking care of that will take care of you. The flu shot won't do it, this will. So, some of the, uh, and I should probably go into what, what we utilize here in the office. It's, it's called the Ultraflora line. It's, it comes in chewable form for the kids. Um, and uh, we have some that are uh, against yeast for use for antibiotics or those that have had too many antibiotics. So that's called acute care. And then there's balance, which is just a maintenance one. And then there's also the intensive care, which has a blend of anti-yeast, anti-fungal, and all the good ones. We have more than that, but that's, that's good enough for now. Um, and yes, it does um, meet label claim uh, about uh, three months after expiration date. Uh, and, and we make uh, very sure of that because we're pretty picky when it comes to quality control. Yep. Yeah, so uh, th there's an article. Uh, where was that article, Dr. Stacy? Do you remember? The one on PubMed, but I think I saw the last one last year in New 
Times? Yeah, okay, so it, it's finding its way into the press too, New York Times even, mentioning that uh, if you put a child on a probiotic that has been proven to be live and good activity, and you start school with it, and you go through the entire cold and flu season, so about till March, April, you have decreased cold and flu incidents significantly. I think they were mentioning something like 70%, mm -hmm. which is just absolutely phenomenal. And all we did was give them some bugs. That's all we did. Yeah, so it's, it's, it, the word is getting out there and I'm, I'm glad to see it. Um, I, I hope the, uh, the word continues. Some of the foods that we can use, food is always the foundation of what we do, correct? So here it is, mushrooms again. No, these are not as powerful as Dr. Kate uh, explained, but mushrooms still is one of our, our foods. I find mushrooms a little bit mysterious. They're, 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 they're not really plants, like Dr. Kate said, and they're not really animal. They're kind of their own deal. And, and um, they, they look so, they, they, when you look at them, they look like they don't have many nutrients in them. It's kind of a bland color, it's white, it's not that vivid blue or purple and yet they are one of the more potent uh, immune stimulating foods that we have. Some of the best antioxidants are blueberries and blackberries um, and we think they work uh, not only by uh, sweeping up poisons within the gut um, but also uh, by just uh, providing a prebiotic to the good bacteria uh, which then of course helps our immune system. Sweet potatoes have a lot of vitamin C. Garlic and onions are probably king and queen over the immune system function. Uh, it is absolutely amazing. Uh, you could spend hours on just this. Um, uh, I know my uh, uncle who just recently turned 94, talked to him on the phone for his birthday, and uh, he looked pretty chipper. He says, well, why do you sound so chipper? Well, I just got off my bicycle. I bicycled for two hours, <laughs> age 94. But I want you to know he eats an onion for breakfast every morning. The whole thing, like an apple. So, I, uh, I think that would take some use, getting used to, but it, this obviously has multiple benefits. Mm -hmm. Fermented foods, and now we're getting into, the, into your microbiome again, okay? Your good bacteria. Uh, uh, fermented foods that we've known for a long, long time. And before people became very sensitive to dairy like they are today, we've always known that uh, buttermilk, kefir, uh, your yogurts, uh, your uh, cabbage that's been fermented, right? Those are all really good foods to you. Uh, today, I just really recommend the uh, cabbages, also uh, known as sauerkraut. Make sure it's not made sour with just vinegar, but it's actually been fermented, okay? That's, it's gotta be done the real way, and it's absolutely amazing how that can affect gut function, which then affects immune function. And your herbal teas, uh, there's plenty of them out there. And I think you would really, uh, uh, that, that's an enjoyable way to uh, boost your immune system. So uh, looking at, at the whole picture, um, when you really start studying all this, you, you can go so in depth. And I had a rather vigorous uh, uh, discussion on Friday, uh, which lasted um, eight hours, nonstop even through lunch, with um, several biochemists and uh, uh, several uh, heads of research on uh, just on ingredients of medical foods. Medical foods are very popular uh, because they detoxify, anti-inflammatory, help with insulin resistance, right? We use medical foods in our office also. And there's a huge debate in the field going on what the composition is of proteins, what kind of fats to use, what kind of carbohydrates, which one does what and how is what. And, and I, I noticed that with these absolutely brilliant, brilliant men and women that I was talking about, and I, I learned a lot from them, but they were just getting buried in all the details, the biochemical pathways, and they were showing me the, the this and that, and the challenge of that, and disabsorption of that, and molecular weight of this. And, 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 and I had to nod in agreement with a lot of what they're saying, but I says, okay, but yeah, but that product is being absorbed and made into muscle mass better than this and, and that's fine and it's good and I, I appreciate the data and it's very helpful, but can the patient tolerate it? How is their gut gonna like that? They went, I literally went down and I saw one guy kind of going like this, <laughs> looking down. And I says, well, isn't that kind of important? Because if, you, if the gut can't tolerate it, which they can't, they cannot tolerate that product, I can tell you that right now from being in the trenches in practice, you're gonna make the patient inflamed and that's gonna cause all kinds of other problems. Back to the drawing board for them. Um, but 
but I, I, I say that little, little fignet of, informa of, of information because we've got this beautiful stuff that's all out there, but the basics are so simple. Get enough sleep. Get outside and spend some time out there. Get your vitamin D up and rolling. This is critical in Michigan. You cannot do without it. St the latest statistic I have from Kent County is that 93% of us are deficient in the winter. In the winter. So that's a huge one. Make sure you're taking a probiotic. That is appropriate for you because the, pro the guts take care of the gut. The gut takes care of you. Your moods, your immune system, your hormones, your digestion, on and on. And make sure that you have as your first line of defense some of these nutrients that you can just pound it with if you do get exposed because we will be exposed. There's no question about it. The only question is don't avoid exposure but make sure that you're ready for the fight so that you don't succumb to it. The doctors here are exposed every day yet we don't see them crumbling thankfully because their immune system is ready for the fight. So it doesn't take that much know-how honestly to do it. And get a good adjustment. Thank you for that. So, and, and why did Dr. Kate shout out about the, about the adjustment? And that, that's actually an important part of the neurological aspect because there has to be a driver for the immune system. What, where does the knowledge go, okay, you go after that virus that way and go after that bacteria that way and go after that fungi that way. And those are all different arms of the immune system it doesn't just happen only in the gut. The gut's only the first line of defense. But wh where does that, that innate knowledge come from? And ultimately, it's the nervous system that drives that. So studies that have been done by the, our wonderful Medicare organization, two studies in fact, have been published recently and it showed that those that got adjusted once a month have 70% fewer colds and flus in their lifetime. Isn't that just unbelievable? I think we should call President Obama with that one. <laughs> and number two, there was another very large independent study that showed 59% fewer hospitalization costs for patients who've been adjusted regularly. I, it, it's, it's been such a slam dunk that the new um, Affordable Health Care Act, as it is called, has uh, now included some chiropractic care because of the tremendous savings that it's shown in, in the healthcare system. So look at it as a whole bunch of things. All the things that we can do. Use food to your benefit. Exercise outside. Um, use your nutraceuticals as needed. I take ultra potent C and vitamin D and a probiotic every day. Okay, I, I consider it just part of being healthy. Uh, make sure you pepper your doctor with whatever questions and if you feel something coming on, call us, get in and do something about it. Make sure you're taking care of your emotional well-being by having a sense of community, that you're not getting all toxic uh, with bad food choices. Did you know, I heard that this weekend, this is a good one, that one ice cream cone which gives you 10 minutes of pleasure has a 180 day effect on you. It's measurable 180 days because there's something called the hemoglobin A1C which affects your red blood cells which can affect your immunity. 180 days for 10 minutes of pleasure. So I know I'm depressing and <laughs> so the chiropractic part of it and so we have all these modalities at your disposal. Pepper us about it. Next month, women's health. And yes, guys, you have to come. I want more guys in here than I want women. Okay? Because if the guys understand even a tidbit of what's going on with women, the world will be a better place. So guys, I expect you to be here. This is an important one, and you're going to get some very late breaking news. And it's got to be a really a fun one. We're going to have a lot of giggles in this one. And a lot of real reality checks. Uh, uh, there's some very sobering statistics on women's health. And I think it's an incredibly important topic. I'm, I think the doctors are very enthused about this one. And we're going to have fun with it. The cooking class, again, sign up now because it will run out of space. We do every time. So you guys always get first dibs at this one. Okay. So having said all that blah blah stuff. Um, questions. This is your time to, to pepper the doctors, uh, use us, abuse us, and uh, we would like to keep it to the topic of immune system for now if we could. Yeah? Yes, your ice cream comment, 
I know it's just a side comment, but I feel like I've seen that like at work and some of my family members. Is that dairy sugar combination? Um, actually, it's the combination. And um, funny you mentioned that because part of my Friday discussion with these researchers was that because they were actually really proposing using some extract of whey protein, which I vehemently opposed. Mm -hmm. And I had a lot of research on that from Erasmus University, which is in Rotterdam, my hometown. And Erasmus University is a little like a Harvard here. It's a very good school. And they put out a lot of research. And they mentioned, and they published this uh, in, in renowned medical journals twice now, that um, dairy is uh, almost certainly the second leading cause of diabetes because it creates an inflammatory response in the gut and plugs up your insulin receptors, which then creates insulin resistance and in adult onset diabetes, dairy is number one, number two cause. To just for complete sake, uh, refined, too many refined carbohydrates like pop was the number one cause. Dairy is the number two cause, and that same article from Erasmus University uh, stated that fried foods was number three. In fact, if you study uh, China, they are worse off than we are with diabetes and childhood obesity, which is unbelievable. Uh, one out of two Chinese uh, children are now in their developed areas, uh, not in the country yet, are now uh, clinically obese. And they think one of the main problems with the Chinese society is their incredible embracements of a fast food change like Kentucky Fried Chicken, which is more prevalent there than Starbucks is in our country. So, so fried foods is another one that we got to really watch. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned appendix in the bacteria. How does the tonsils relate to um, the immune system? Okay. Tonsils are really interesting, and there's some fairly late breaking news on that. Uh, it's a storage of T lymphocytes. It's our first line of defense against upper respiratory infections. A little like the guts is our first line of defense here. And so it, it's, it literally. Uh, uh, if something comes on uh, sinus-wise or throat-wise, our little extra storage house of white blood cells can go to work immediately because they're stored in the tonsils. So yeah, they're, they're a very important part of, all, of all our first line of defense. Because it seems like most kids these days are taking out the tonsils. Yeah, it, yes. <laughs> That's just, you know, there, there's so many things that we're doing. Um, there's so many things that we're doing, you know. You, you can ask that, why 40% C-section? Why, why, uh, why do we clamp off the umbilical cord immediately when it's providing oxygen interest to the newborn baby? Why do, we, why do we do a lot of things? It's all this intervention that is so often unnecessary. I, you know, the list goes on and on and on. It's rather unfortunate. Yeah. If I can add to that too, yeah. sometimes it's a little sad, but people find it easier to have a surgery than to make a diet change. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of times you'll see those kind of results because of that. Uh, just That's just the general, that's a cultural thing, I think, and we're, yeah. that's what we're working to change. Yeah, it, my wife was commenting on that all the time because she's been so involved with I five kids and so she's been PTA president and you know, very involved with all, all the all, all this things going on in school. And, and uh, they come up to her because she knows that we're into this stuff, and to them that's kind of foreign. And they sometimes ask her about, um, you know, my, my kid is, uh, has an autistic spectrum disorder or an ADHD or something like that. And, and because they ask, she'll, she'll give just a bit of advice because she knows if it gives too much, it just, but she'll say something like, well, you know, your, your child probably shouldn't have food colors or something like that, you know, stuff that's just outright banned in the rest of the world, uh, literally. And it almost always, oh, I can't do that, how can I do that? And, and you know, we come across that, so they, the, the parent chooses the medication, which is a class one drug, which is highly addictive, which raises the chance of drug addiction with that child, and the 18, up to 70% of them then become drug abusers, and they're altering the mental capacity for the rest of their life, only because they didn't want to take them out food colors. You know, to, to, to us, that's so, we, we just don't get that. And so but we're, we're, we're against, so, I don't understand, don't, I, I don't understand but, but you're a special select few. You're, you're not a cross section of American that way. So I, I don't know what to say, but I, all I can tell you, we're gonna to continue to proselytize. We're gonna to continue to, to do, do these things and just keep her rolling. And yes, it's getting way too late. I'm getting a look. Well, don't forget yeah. that we also have patients here that have very large tonsils and they're very healthy. Yeah. Mm -hmm.
Mm -hmm. the, the medical, uh, the medical determinant of getting your tonsils out is you have to have two to three millimeter space in between, and that's okay. If, if you're right next to each other, then you're going to start obstructing your pathway for breathing at night. And last time I checked, oxygen is kind of important. Um, so yes, you do want to get those tonsils out because there's no other way of doing it. We are not opposed to these medical interventions. I want you to know that we are not. But we're into medical minimalism, and if we should try other things first, if that works, awesome. And believe me, it does most of the time. And if it doesn't, then you've got medical intervention, which will greatly help that child, and we try to compensate for the loss of tonsils after that. Does that make sense? Just a lot of people. Thank you. For Thank you for being here. Really appreciate it. See you guys all